uh, Claire is senior research fellow and you are managing the hierarchical phase contrast tomography imaging project that uh, resulted in this human organ atlas so so that's very very good and i let you now speak you have like 10 15 minutes and i will interrupt you if needed because that's that's my greatest pleasure in life interrupting people so <laughs> there you go thank you very much and thank you for the, the invitation to speak and, and for the introduction so i'm going to talk to you um andy asked me to talk a little bit about our um, experiences of the project and hip ct so just as a very uh, brief overview for people who aren't aware um hip ct hierarchical phase contrast tomography it's this technique that's um reliant on the ebs uh we scan intact human organs ex vivo so these are, are donated and they're scanned the entire organ is scanned uh at an overview resolution of about 20 micrometers and then small portions um can be scanned at higher resolution and it's a, a phase contrast technique and here it's just this is the overview of our sample preparation our scanning and then the data sharing and analysis side and this is the part that um, we really uh, became involved with uh, Panos team so the human organ atlas this is the portal that you've already seen is accessible here this is an old view it now has this um, this has just recently been replaced and the idea of the human organ atlas was really to enable the data from this technique to be shared uh, in accordance with the fair principles to get reuse and to get you know um, buy-in and collaborators and people to access and use the data. Um, so if I run this, oh, let me turn there. So this is just um, showing you a little bit about the portal. Um, it is organized according to um, organ donors. You can click and we have all these abilities to search the data by age, by organ and also by um, the pathology. So certain types of pathology are tagged. And this is something um, that's, it's really um, interesting and it makes the metadata <laughs> that much harder to describe. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about metadata. This is the reconstruction um, that uh, Andy Audrey showed you earlier. So that's sort of an overview of uh, what was created. So, and, um, so just to give you a bit of an overview of some of the figures from the portal that Andy kindly uh, gave me before. So these are the downloads, the data sets we have downloaded at the moment. Uh, there's about 50 data sets up on the portal. And these are just those that are downloaded. So by far the, the favorite is the whole um, brain organ. And this sort of accords with the interest from collaborating people we've had. In. And then uh, interestingly enough, one of our lung volumes of interest that's at a 6.5, it's like an intermediate resolution for us is the next most downloaded. Um, I'm not quite sure why. And then a whole load of our other images here. Interesting enough, a lot of the gallery images. So we provide just sort of a, a gallery image for people to take a look at uh, up there on the downloads. Um, this is the number of visits to our site, uh, since the portal since um, it was created. And you can see this big spike here. And Andy asked me before, he's like, it's interesting. I wonder what happened there. So I had a little look back through the history and this was the, the day that National Geographic published an article on the um, on the project, so it caused this big spike in uh, the number of visits we saw, um, which I think is interesting. It shows the kind of reach of, of these sort of uh, public engagement articles and how they can increase engagement with the data. One thing that's um, interesting, we can't tell sort of the types of interactions. We can see how long people are interacting with the site with, but it's difficult to know if these are people who are just citizen science interested in the data, scientists trying to download the data and engage. Um, that's not entirely clear. Um, a, couple, a case study in particular of the data. So this is actually something that just popped up the other day. So these are two papers um, written by the same group. They were published about two weeks ago on archive. And these are people who have downloaded the data and used it completely independently um, of us. So they downloaded it from the portal and they're using it to develop um, compression algorithms so for image compression so this is our brain data here and this is the heart data here uh, this is the ground truth of our data then this is their algorithm compared to kind of other state of the arts and this was quite fun for me because uh, you know pop, popped up that uh, this had cited our paper and then uh, i looked through and, and you realize that they genuinely downloaded the data reused the data in something 
entirely novel and kind of unconnected to, to what we're doing. So that was very interesting. One thing to note, um, so they cited the original paper, but the specific DOIs for the data sets aren't um, cited. So just a point of interest there. Um, we talked a little bit about um, new aspects and challenges. So I think you already saw, oh, wait, sorry, let me turn the sound down on that. You already saw, um, this is the interspectral data portal that, that Andy showed you earlier, uh, setting up. And this was, um, we did this in response to the idea that people wanted to have more visualization in the portal. They wanted to look at the data set before they necessarily downloaded it. And a lot of our collaborators, medical collaborators, don't have the resource to actually download and visualize these data sets. So they wanted something that could be visualized on the fly. So we kind of launched into testing a few different things out. We looked at interspectral, and we've also um, looked at NeuroGlancer, which utilizes the NeuroGlancer cloud resource. And you can see it here. They're two very different approaches. The interspectral, um, very much the company that we're providing, they, they took our data off the portal and have uh, performed you know, some opacity uh, function and things. This is that data set. NeuroGlancer is very much more something that we did within our own team. Um, it's an open source platform, a WebGL base, and we've used that as well. It has a, not the same type of functionality. And I think it highlighted to us an interesting thing. It's who are you making the visualization for? What do they need and what do they want? The other thing that it really highlighted to us, so we're trying to automate um, the integration of something like NeuroGlancer into the pipeline. Um, and it made us realize to make you know these data sets machine readable and stuff, data curation, data curation, data curation. It's come up quite a few times here and metadata. Um, automating these pipelines highlighted our data curation processes have flaws in that we need to fix. And our metadata is, continuously challenging us. And I'll explain a bit more about that next. So, hang on. so recently we've had quite a big increase in the data production um, from our project. So we moved from Beamline BM05 to BM18 and BM18 is you know becoming fully towards fully commissioned now. And we've had a huge increase in the speed at which we're producing data. So, on the right hand side here, this was our original kind of data sets that we were getting and what sort of on the portal, you had the whole organ at 50 to 80 gigabytes and you could have regions of interest, entire data sets are about 1.5 terabytes. We're now routinely producing a terabyte an hour of raw data. Um, our latest whole organ data sets are 10 times larger than they used to be. There were 805 gigabytes for a single organ. Um, that's this whole organ overview. Um, and that's in a JPEG 2000, so it's in a compressed form. Um, and this is really challenging to be able to keep up the data pipelines. They need to be operating very smoothly and very efficiently to keep up with this scale of data production. And keeping on top of the metadata and the data curation is one of our biggest challenges that we have found and something that we're still actively working on. Um, we're also expanding have more and more collaborated in. We have this meeting soon for a community access. Um, and I expect to see a big spike in the portal again following this because we'll highlight the portal at that meeting. Um, and we're really looking to expand the user community. And as we do that and people become even more aware of the technique, there'll be even more need for fair data and for this data to become easily accessible um, across, across the world. Um, so just as a little brief summary, um, the whole work has been made for human organ atlas open to very many people. The data is being used and resulting in publications, which is pretty cool. Um, we've started exploring this uh, visualization to try and make it more accessible. Um, interaction via cloud-based object data storage seems to be the best way to go, but it's challenging to make it affordable. And we've also found that the data curation it's really difficult. I think that's something that comes up again and again. Um, we're growing. How do we uh, expand and keep pace um, with all this expanding interest and the expanding data set? Um, so I'd just like to say a big thank you to Annie, the panelist team, everyone who's helped us at ESRF and also to the rest of the team. It's a huge, a huge team that, um, that work on this project.
Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. So I'm wondering, do we have any questions online for Claire? No questions. Anyone has any questions for Claire here in the room in Grenoble? There is a question from Andy. So let's go. Yeah, I just like to, I mean, it's very impressive what you've done. So it's really nice to hear. What I was wondering is what could we do to make the data DOIs more cited? Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting one. Um, so it's already on the portal. When you click to download a data set, it says, you know, if you're going to use this data set, please cite this, um, this DOI. Um, I'm not sure. I think, you know, a, requ a requirement from like engaging maybe with publishers, because ideally people should be providing references to their raw data in their publications. And so if, if there's the data access in your, in your data availability statement, people ideally would be providing the DOIs there. So it's maybe engaging with publishers slightly um, because they're the ones that are going to push for other people to be citing the DOIs correctly, I would say. Okay, well, thank you very much, Claire, once again. And now we'll go to the next talk that is by Hans van Hoor. Hans was our former World Package for LIDA and now he's head of scientific support in Max Planck Institute. And you also, I think, that go from time to time to the Uni of Manchester to, to do some, some lectures. You are a professor there on computational modeling. So, Hans, I don't there. Know, you are talking. Yes, we can hear you. You have your slides. All good. So, you have 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes. All right. It's Southampton, not Manchester, but it doesn't really matter. Just the name. Um, so, I've just learned that I'm the Jupiter guy, and so I should be talking about uh, Jupiter. Um, those are my topics. I'll drift to Binder because I think that's uh, full of potential. Uh, I guess we've seen all this. This is what a Jupiter notebook looks like. And the question you can ask is, why is it apparently interesting? Uh, why do people actually like to use it or accept to use it? Uh, and I wanted to point out um, this paper by uh, Fernando Perez and Brian Granger, who kind of started this IPython and later Jupyter Notebook project. And I thought they had the interesting idea that the notebook helps people to think, and that this is quite important, and I would agree with that. Um, there are two other papers I would recommend, and I briefly looked at this one, the last one, which we have written as part of the PANAS project, and where I've been involved in the proposal writing in the first two years. And so I opened this um, this paper looked at it and found um, that, of course, there's a large list of authors. Many of those are probably in Grenoble now, and that's very nice. And then I flicked through this, and um, it describes various use cases for Jupyter Notebooks, um, which we've seen today already, that people analyze data from it, or we can keep those notebooks as a collection of recipes of recurring tasks, um, and other applications uh, for which I haven't got time to talk about, there is a Jupyter Hub as an interface so that the notebook can be used to use an HPC or storage facility remotely. Um, the, the paper doesn't mention that this is like a, a remote X um, replacement, but I think that's what increasingly is happening, or at least we see with many users at European Expo uh, and other HPC facilities. It turns out there is also a section in this paper labeled Vision for European Open Science Cloud. And as this is a Panos paper, uh, it seemed appropriate to get back to that. So what does that um, say? So this is from that paper. It said, we'd like to have a, a data analysis framework that allows remote interactive data analysis. And then it goes on to suggest that the Jupyter notebooks might be a possible or good choice here because they encapsulate what we have to do with the data because they combine the data with the software. And of course, the, the software doesn't have to be in the notebook. Maybe we're just calling it from the notebook. Um, but it is the idea of bringing the data and the software together. And then there was this idea that one would be able to re-execute those notebooks uh, through some access points in the European Open Science Cloud. So what I want to do is to revisit this idea, say what has happened, uh, what is missing, and perhaps also what blockers we have in the way. 
And I want to start with a use case that Andy kindly uh, announced already, that of reproducible publications. Here the idea is that we have a publication and together with that, we publish some kind of data repository, which combines the actual data that we care about and a, a notebook, which does something with the data, for example, to produce the figures that are um, published in that paper. Here's an example, which some of you may have seen already. This is the figure two from the paper. And with that, there was a uh, Git repository published on GitHub and then made available via Zenodo, where there is um, a notebook per figure. And this is how the notebook starts. And at the very end of it, this figure is um, created. Um, so this is the same repository here. We see the various notebook files for the important figures and findings in that publication. Once we have that set up, we need to talk about Binder. The Binder software and Binder project is the idea that we have some data repository. Often it's a Git repository on GitHub, but it doesn't have to be, uh, which contains data and some notebooks, and also a specification of the software that is needed to execute um, the notebooks. And given these ingredients, Binder can then uh, be given the URL of this data repository, and it will build a container, a Docker container in this case, um, that contains the right software, and it also installs a Jupyter Notebook server, starts the server, and connects that server to the user's browser, which could be somebody uh, far away um, having the browser running on their laptop. Um, there is a binder service running, which is called mybinder.org, so this is open. Anybody can use it, um, and that will allow you to execute such reproducible papers in that way. For the example I've shown, the software was specified through a file called environment.yaml, which is a conda specification, but Binder will understand a number of different formats, more are listed here. And I think that was one important design decision in Binder that it accepts any existing standard for software specification, and it tries very hard not to invent a new standard. And this seems to work relatively well for the software specification. Okay, before I move away from uh, the binder introduction, I want to mention a few use cases for this binder software. One is that of reproducibility, which I've outlined already. Um, one can also use it to provide zero install software to users. For example, for a summer school, one can prepare, prepare a repository, which brings its own software environment, which is then cloud hosted through binder and participants don't need to install anything and can just use the browser of their choice on the operating system of their choice, on their um, hardware of their choice. A third use case I want to bring up is that of data access. Uh, there's the idea that I use the notebook to describe how to access data. So let me uh, go back to this EOS Jupyter vision. I described use case one, which was about reproducible publications. And the second use case I want to suggest is that of data access. And I've put in italics the words that have changed. So here, this is about data access, not repeating an analysis. Um, and this is about experiment data rather than publication data. And of course, one could include with this repository for a data set also some examples how to analyze the data, because that would actually be useful. So it turns out in some way, uh, these two use cases are actually rather similar. One is focused on the reproducing publications, the other one on accessing, reading, and interpreting data correctly. Uh, and perhaps with the experimental data here, the size of the data set can be a lot larger, but of course there is a large similarity. And this idea of accessing data through Binder has already um, has been realized from, from some institutions. So here is an example from the Max Planck data repository called Edmund, which uses the Dataverse software. And this is a deposited data set, which has a Jupyter notebook file. And when I choose to access this, I have the option to explore that in my binder. It will use the MyBinder service to fire up an instance, install the software I need, which is part of that repository, and allows me to explore that data interactively. This is all good if the data set is small. Uh, because the process is such that when this Docker container is built, 
um, it copies all the data from the repository to the cloud where this Docker container is hosted. So that's not so practical for uh, many of the photon and neutron science use cases. Okay, so having given that introduction, I now want to um, summarize and discuss the main question, and that is what are the challenges for moving to this um, EOS Jupiter vision, as I've now called it, having seen that um, paper. Um, so the first thing we need is that um, we have scientists who are actually willing to express their analysis um, in these notebooks, for example. Um, and I think that is, that's kind of, um, okay, we've seen that uh, scientists accept the notebook, uh, and the user behavior here is on our side. Um, then before the software in these notebooks or in the supporting other files in that data repository can be executed, we need the right software environment. Uh, and that's actually quite hard because we need to know what software is needed, which versions are needed, and if there's something to compile, how it should be done, which flags are we using? and so on. And this is uh, well supported by the spineless software specification, which sits on top of existing standards. So of course a bit harder, but if any user uh, works systematically, they have this anyway, or can get support from the data steward. The things that are not ready yet or are problematic is if we have large data sets. Then the question is, where do we find the data? Uh, and how can we access it? And there has been an attempt to extend Binder with these capabilities in a, in a recent grant proposal, which uh, sadly has not been funded because there wasn't enough impact, um, was the response of the reviewer. Um, and the other problem is that if the data is so large that we cannot make it available transparently, uh, we may need to have Binder instances close to the data source. And these points relate closely to what uh, Jean Francois already indicated in his, his presentation. Okay, so uh, to close, how fair is data access uh, with Project Jupiter? Not sure the findable applies. The accessibility from a techno technology point of view is good because people just need a browser. The rest of the complexity is done at the server side. Um, the data is interoperable in the sense that if you're happy with the programming language used in the notebook or in the repository, then it's machine readable and you can connect to that. And what I think is really important from a practical point of view is to have this ability to recreate or preserve the right software environment. And um, in this binder is uh, relatively strong already. So I want to close. Um, I try to reminders of this EOS Jupyter vision, which I had forgotten, but we phrased it together in this paper, um, that we make the data available together with the software and the specification of how to build the software. And um, the big blockers from being able to roll this out for any sort of problem, uh, in particular, the problems with large data sets are difficult, is that we don't know how to uh, transfer the data and access it transparently. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Do we have any questions particularly addressed to Hans online? No. Anyone wants to say something here before John will speak? No questions for you, Hans, but you are not off the hook, then we'll have the round table. So Absolutely. now, John, if you are ready, just to say that, John, you are a emeritus chemistry professor and you are in the U IUCR, the International Union of Crystallography. And with that, I let you do your presentation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me? One thumbs up, perhaps? Yes, we can hear you loud right. and clear. Um, so I'm using the template uh, Andy provided, so it's a bit cluttered, but anyway, the key word there is crystallography. Um, and for my sins, I'm chairman of the IUCR's committee on data and its representative uh, to core data. And I mentioned one of the projects I'm taking part in with Protein Data Bank Japan uh, this morning. And I did thank Fabio uh, for his, his answer and John Francois, but I, I couldn't, we couldn't unmute myself uh, this morning, but we can later on. Right, so 
Um, Andy provided uh, this framework, um, what's been achieved, what is still missing, uh, what um, might be the ways to steer towards a more fair uh, culture amongst photon and neutron user community from our experiences in crystallography. Um, so I'll attempt to do that. Um, and I call it a user's vision. It's a bit of a broad church, of course, in crystallography. But uh, now the, the, the visions, there's a huge overlap between the vision of Panosk um, and IUCRs. And you see basically um, two identical lists here uh, on the left for Panosk and on the right for IUCR. Um, I think we share trust in science as a paramount thing. Um, we share uh, a great enthusiasm for the new opportunities that large digital archives present in linking to the experimental data, not just the processed and the derived models. Um, our ways of consultation to our communities, of course, different. Um, we consult um, the IUCR commissions, of which is uh, 20 or more. Um, and you, you consult the various European photon and neutron facilities. Um, we share a concern about uh, unpublished data. The facilities, um, having been a joint appointment with Darsbury for, for uh, a long time, of course, you, you're always concerned about um, the publication rates from the measurements that you've made. Um, in IUCR, I suppose, it, as a, in effect, a professional organisation, um, our concern for unpublished data is from the point of view of the individual crystallographers as professional scientists, and ultimately publication is how uh, your scientific contributions are recognised. And of course, the uh, facilities are now fantastic, but so are the detectors. And so the modern data rates are a challenge in, in numerous uh, ways, not least uh, archiving and, and providing that version of record to the experiment. So it's, it can be quite difficult. And um, the square kilometre array people in radio astronomy have, have openly declared that they uh, simply can't preserve their raw data. There's too much of it. And so they can only do from the process data onwards. Now, what has been achieved in the IUCR global community? Well, we have this overarching uh, crystallographic information framework and the superscript here um, is to our committee for the maintenance of this uh, crystallographic information framework uh, standard. And this committee uh, chair is James Hester uh, in Australia from ANSTO. And this is, goes back a long time. So Sid Hall in Perth in Australia um, introduced this approach, the crystallographic information file in, in 1991. And it affects the trust that you want in data transmission and exchange, and also um, allows for detailed automatic checking. So we have the check SIF. Um, there's a web link at the IUCR uh, website to look at the derived coordinate data firstly, that was started in 1998. And then when archives expanded to allow uh, archiving of the processed uh, structure factors, uh, the diffraction images, the Bragg intensities reduce enormously to the structure factor data set. Uh, that was introduced in 2007. And so data consistency checks uh, affect good standards. Now the PDB, they started um, in 2003 um, with uh, validation for their depositions from uh, depositors. And we keenly supported that. And at the time I was editor in chief for Acta Crystallographica. Let me just find a, a pointer here. Um, and we keenly supported that. And the actual term validation report, um, which journals now uh, formally require um, in their peer review procedures, um, that was introduced from 2010 uh, onwards. So in terms of Andy's question, what is still missing? Uh, we would perhaps rephrase that to say uh, work still underway. And it's, it's coming from this uh, new opportunities and initiatives from being able to store the experimental raw data. And so that gives these four bullet points here. 
a better understanding of what we do experimentally, uh, harnessing new methods and software, enabling new science, and understanding the subjective choices that we make in our raw diffraction data processing. And different people process, make decisions in a different way at different points of the processing, even though it can be more, more and more automatic. Now the above are in addition to these decades long benefits of having preserved coordinates, namely structure and bonding trends and snapshots of conformational dynamics. And when the process diffraction data was starting to be saved, then of course you could then do re-refinement of the model structure um, that the authors had arrived at based on their own uh, uh, diffraction image data processing. So that uh, re-refinement, reuse in a more modern term, I suppose, um, has come from archiving of the uh, process diffraction data. Now, recently, the IUCR journals launched the IUCR data's raw data letters. And here is a, a simple screenshot of the first one and uh, led by Lois Kroon Battenberg, who is the main editor of Raw Data Letters. So they'd already published the structure from their diffraction data, but this was, was not an easy um, diffraction images data set with twinning and also extensive diffuse scattering. So basically this paper is explaining that they think uh, there really is more to be uh, understood from these diffraction data than what they've published so far. Now to assist the whole procedure, um, and I'll come to my detail thanks to Panosk in a moment, um, we have this uh, CHECKSIF for raw data. And you can see here the various tests that are made on the diffraction images. And in this case, of course, it's a published paper, therefore all, um, all the answers are pass. Everything is satisfactory. But we also, um, generate a, a table one of the raw data deep details for the paper from this uh, CHECKSIF. So that's extending this concept that I mentioned in the earlier slide. Now, we are very grateful to PANOSC. Um, so um, the uh, project team uh, members are listed here. Um, Lowe's led this uh, with James Hester from ComSIF, but specifically Fabio Julian Horsch, who I see is also attending, and Andy and the staff at IUCR editorial office, uh, you know, Panos have made a big contribution here. And we imagine this will be useful for the PAN facilities for the reusability of crystallographic raw diffraction images. And perhaps that concept can be expanded into the domains of imaging and spectroscopy and facilitate the ease of reuse of the uh, raw data in your uh, PAN data catalogues. Now, what about the hints on steering a change to a, a more fair uh, culture? Well, to give some detail about our community consultations, um, the chemical crystallographers, uh, led by Amy Sargent and Simon Coles, uh, America and UK respectively, uh, first of all, organised a questionnaire to the community advertised in the IUCR newsletter, and then a workshop linked to the IUCR Prague Con Congress last year. And they asked the question, when should small molecule crystallographers publish their raw diffraction data? And their answer, in, in effect, was look, we're a fairly mature uh, methodology. And so the answer for going all the way back to raw data should be only in special cases. Um, so that's an interesting uh, one. Um, powder diffraction, there's a very nice policy uh, discussion paper uh, in J. Apple Christ in 2018 from Miguel Aranda, who you will all know, uh, was ALBA science director until recently. Um, and he looks at the challenges and the benefits. It's a very interesting paper, which the Powder Diffraction Commission of IUCR is, is looking at carefully. Now already implemented, the IUCR Commission on Biological Macromolecules, led by, uh, chaired by Vladek Miner in uh, University of Virginia, USA, has effected changes in the IUCR journal's note for authors. So that means that data processing methods and new structure papers must cite uh, 
the underpinning raw data. And that, of course, is in addition to the PDB depositions that go with any, uh, any paper. Just to advertise, um, we've got a workshop at the next IUCR Congress in Melbourne next year in August um, on raw diffraction data reuse, the good, the bad, and the challenging. The um, uh, web link is here, and you can see uh, we're at an advanced stage of planning. <clears throat> and I would also advertise that uh, Andy uh, Gertz is our one of our 32 uh, Congress keynote speakers. And so we're very much looking forward to hearing Andy's keynote next year. So um, all of this isn't me, of course. And so um, IUCR, uh, we had a diffraction data deposition working group looking at the uh, costs and benefits of extending uh, community archiving to the raw data. And we uh, were convened in the Madrid IUCR in 2011, and we reported at the Hyderabad Congress in 2017. The working group morphed into um, the Standing Committee uh, on data in 2017. You can find our uh, website here. And we've also been very uh, ably assisted in some detailed questions by the Code Data uh, Policy uh, Committee. And I give you uh, their web, web link uh, there. And with that, until the panel discussion, at least, I've got a couple more slides to show you, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. So before we go with the panel discussion, I'm wondering where there are any questions specifically about your slides? No, so now we have Claire, John, Hans. So now comes the panel and I don't know if anyone again has any questions for the three of them to discuss and to talk about otherwise i have like a couple of questions ready and this lifting the hand he always has something to say it's incredible <laughs> let's go the keynote note speaker next year <laughs> no, well, we also, thank you just to John for the thanks because you're the one who's driving this. So you contacted me and uh, we could help you. So we're very happy to be involved with this because it makes a link to the scientist. But my question to all three of you almost is, um, Claire mentioned these huge data volumes now that they're producing every hour. Uh, John, you, you also presented the need to store uh, the raw data and make it accessible. Uh, and Hans also, we can't move bind the data to bind them back. So what, what we're thinking is we have to go towards some more uh, data compression and to gain in that we have to also do lossy compression. But it seems like, you know, we just recently at ESRF, we had this, exp we have this experiment, zero crystallography, where a lot of work went into data compression. But the first reactions, which are understandable, but I was wondering how to e make that move ahead from the user group is we want the uncompressed data. But, <laughs> you know, we, there, there's a financial cost now, which is really non-negligible in uncompressed data. So I'm thinking, uh, how can you as a scientific community help co move towards lossy compression or, you know, financially sustainable compression? Yeah. We've thought quite a bit about this, so I, I can start if you like, um, if the other uh, fellow panelists agree. Um, I mean, I gave a hint, first of all, with the square kilometre array people. I mean, I think it's perfectly OK um, to just say, look, we can't do it. And, you know, that's their position. Um, now, I, I don't think we are uh, in that uh, state of data uh, rates and Andy you and I and and um, colleagues at ESS uh, Tobias uh, Richter and, and John Taylor now at Ridge um, you know we put a, a very thoughtful paper uh, we, we believe into uh, Zenodo and um, comparing data rates with the generations of tapes and you know there's a lot yet to come with improved tape capacities but of course that's cold storage and, and not immediate access storage. So I think, you know, there is a bit of an, um, the jury's out in terms of irresistible force making a movable object. Um, 
I think thirdly, it's obvious from our consultations, I think it's different from yours perhaps, um, that different communities are not of the same mind. So the macromolecular crystallographers are very enthusiastic about raw data. It's not as mature a method um, as chemical crystallography. Um, and so, you, you know, there's um, a filtering going on there uh, about how much raw data should be preserved. And then fourthly, I think we need to understand better this unpublished data. You know, what fraction of, of measured data lead to publication? Because it, it potentially is a very big filter. Um, and of course, we want to understand better, um, you know, from your point of view, the facilities and, and for, for us as a professional society organization, you know, representing crystallographers, uh, what it means for, for perhaps all those studies that for the crystallographers make and don't get published. So there, I think there are some questions there as well, which you know, we don't have the details, it seems to me. I, I, I pose that quite a bit this year is a que the question on fraction of unpublished data at facilities and I'm getting some informal feedback so from neutrons for example colleagues are saying well maybe about half of perfectly respectable data sets are not getting priority they deserve from the PIs and they're finding that frustrating but I haven't had any equivalent feedback from the uh, synchrotron or x-ray laser facilities. I'll stop with those four points. Claire, did you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, sure, it's a, a slightly different perspective. So we put quite a lot of uh, time and effort at the beginning into compressing the data. So I said we store most of our data as a JPEG 2000, so it's a slightly lossy um, compression. Um, and we put it all up onto the Organ Atlas, originally in JPEG 2000. And uh, a lot of the community couldn't download it and they wanted it binned. So we provided it binned and this made it a bit better. Um, so that's you know, a compression format there. And then we started to collaborate um, a bit with Google to try and get the data more accessible. And they were like, why is it in JPEG 2000? And we were like, oh, for compression. And they were like, how big's the data? So they were like, oh, you know, it's like about two terabytes for an organ. And they were like, ha, ah, give it to us and just uncompress it all and put it on the cloud. On the Google Cloud, so this this kind of di disjoint between, you know, some of the big big data infrastructures that are saying, "Why are you compressing? We have the storage," versus, you know, needing to be compressed. Most of the people who are actually interacting with the data day in day out, as you say, aren't able to handle the uncompressed, and we aren't able to indefinitely store it. There's you know a carbon cost to all this data storage as well. That's very much not insignificant. It's not really an answer, sorry, it's just my normal experience. I think it's very interesting, but yeah, yeah, we have different uh, scales of infrastructure. So yeah, we 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 would struggle to serve a hundred terabyte data set, but Google says uh, that's that's not an issue. Mm. Uh, maybe I carry on. Um, so I would say that there is a period of data analysis straight after the experiment where one needs immediate access to the hot data for analysis. Um, and, and, and after that, I think there's a huge potential to save space. And so this could be after six months or, or some, even some user-defined period, perhaps. Um, and I would suggest that um, the first one could try some social engineering to make users delete the data themselves, the, the not so useful runs, or at least select those that need to go. Of course, there needs to be some pressure to do this. But if um, they are afraid of the lossy compression, an alternative may be to um, just mark the data that is not needed later on anyway. And then I think we need incentives for this behavior um, because I know from European extra that the perception from the beamline scientists and the users is that data is free, data storage. You just press the button, it records, and there's no cost associated. This is managed by a different unit. Uh, and they're busily buying stuff, <laughs> uh, but the connection is missing. Uh, and one could also ask um, what, what parts of the data have been used in publications three years after the beam time, and do we really need the rest? Or we could invent a PPP ratio, a publication per petabyte, uh, <laughs> perhaps, and make, 
you know, make, make this a metric for people to apply for a new beam time. Of course, this will be field dependent and so on. Uh, but perhaps then it would be encouraging to delete some of the data where the scientist knows already um, a flap has been closed and there is no data because that will improve this publication per petabyte ratio just by reducing the data. Okay, so I think making the cost known to users and scientists will help, but coming back to Andy's original question about the uh, lossy compression, because I haven't got a good answer, I had to work around that. Um, I think it might help to study systematically what kind of effect this has on the data analysis. Because in the end, it's a scientist, so if we can convince them that it doesn't really matter whether it's compressed or not, then um, it's a much easier game, if that is possible. Just to come to your question about the cost of data, do you think it would have an impact on scientists uh, uh, if we mention the carbon footprint of data, if we added that? Yes, definitely. Okay, because I think that was one of the suggestions that I was thinking is that people realize this data came at a cost to the environment also, not just to the facilities. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's a complete lack of awareness of, of those difficulties and the, the efforts that we're dealing with here on the scientist side, at least at European Expo two years ago. Okay, I mean, we have a question in the room, so I'll pass the microphone. Bear with me a sec. Hi, I'm interested in what funding lines are available for people to work with the data that is published and available. So um, there was this mention of the uh, archive papers working with the data from the human organ access. But anecdotally, um, I've talked to people before who said they really struggle to get funding to look at old data or to reuse old data. And I wondered if you had any comments there. Um, yeah, I guess I never, I'm actually, I'm scooching through the paper now to look at their acknowledgements to see who, um, who funded the the work I can't I can't immediately see it I guess the the key here on looking at the the old data is for them it's a it's a it's a funding to develop an algorithm right and our the data is being used to benchmark the algorithm against other existing algorithms um so that's the kind of the angle that this that this group uh were looking at and so I, I guess it's, you know, it's very much computational funders that are interested in computational basis. Or I think also if there's a really good way to um, interrogate like the search functions um, the, that we were talking about, if there's a really good way to prove that a database has the samples and the quality of the data you would need to, to answer a very specific biological question, then I can see that making a very good um, application. Uh, like, so I think it depends on the specific use to which you want to put the data, but having a portal or something that's easy to interrogate to, you know, kind of essentially, it essentially should be quite a, an attractive thing to funders, right? If you can show that the database has the data that you would need and you know that you have an algorithm, you just need some time. It's a very, um, it should be a very attractive proposal because it's fairly low risk. If, if I may come in here and, and build on what Hans and Claire have just said in, in, in answer to the, the questioner, um, I mean, you know, historically, Cambridge Structured Database, um, you know, they, they were funded from public money in, in the UK. And then um, let's blame it on Mrs. Thatcher. Um, she came along and said, well, um, if, it, if people value it, then uh, they'll pay for its use. And so it moved from being uh, publicly funded to um, um, a subscription uh, base. Um, and of course, it's a registered charity, it's a not-for-profit. So, you know, it, it's done its best to um, preserve it. It's, um, you know, zero cost uh, to user as much as possible. Um, the Proning Data Bank, of course, works on a different model, where is it still within uh, the uh, fun publicly funded uh, model. And so that's the exemplar today from within crystallography of being free 
uh, for users, depositors, and free for um, people accessing the results. Um, long, long be it continue, but um, it, you know, another Mrs. Thatcher might come along. So I think hands, you know, the, the publication per uh, petabyte was it? Um, it's quite <laughs> a good one um, as, as to uh, how we might monitor this. I mean, you know, ultimately, if I may go above mere practicalities of money, um, you know, the journals uh, in principle, I mean, their role is to, to mark, you know, the, the moments of history when studies are reported and you've got to have everything, haven't you? I mean, the US National Academy's recent report on reproducibility and replicability emphasized that. And so, I mean, you know, Phil Trans went, goes back 300 plus years. So ultimately, journals should bear the cost of what's part of the published um, uh, knowledge base. Um, facilities, if I may offer a Darsbury perspective, we ran from 1981 to 2008. So that's a, you know, a mere blink of the eye of you know, 30 years only. Journals will pipe up and say, oh, no, we can't by the costs, but um, there we are. Yeah, but, but I, th I think there's some, it's a good point in this, and that is that the, the incentive for the scientists is to publish, and if having the data curated, the relevant data set selected, therefore in size reduced, if that is part of the publication process and compulsory, then it will actually happen. At the moment, we have a scenario where some people are um, interested in that and maybe invest some extra effort, but I think many scientists will just ignore the um, what they should be doing for data quality, uh, even according to the, the submission guidelines of the journals. Yeah, and I think also, Hans, it, it, I mean, the most wounding thing that can happen to a scientist is, is somebody comes along and says, I can't reproduce what you've done. And so you know, it's a great uh, asset to a paper to have the raw data, the process, the derived model, the workflow, and you explain it, you know, and these days with, with the web and not print, you, you can more or less take it outside the format of, of a particular journal, of course, you can take as many words as you want and as much data space as you need to protect yourself against the accusation of irreproducible. And if you have done the analysis in some scripted approach, you can just deposit that. There's no extra work. It's machine readable. It's yeah, incredibly work. efficient. I mean, the Jupyter stuff is very impressive. I'm showing my age and I need to learn to use it. But the same could be done in a third script, of course. This is, uh... I'm confessing to pen and paper uh, tradition at some point in my work, yeah. Okay, we have another question here in the room, so I'll walk. Oh, Andrew is walking towards me, saying me some time. That's good. Okay, so this discussion that's happening kind of links into a question I had about Hans's talk about the role of Jupiter in reproducible research, essentially. Does it, do you think it needs to be Jupiter? Is there a benefit to being Jupiter over just scripts in a well-written paper? Because so when I try and publish things in a reproducible way, I started out using Jupiter, having a make file that translated my Jupiter into a Python script and then ran all the Python scripts and made all the figures and all that jazz. But as I'm doing more and more of this, I'm realizing that the Jupiter is not really actually offering anything beyond what the text of the paper and the scripts are offering. So I've kind of dropped the Jupyter part out of it. And now when I do it, I'm using, I don't know if you're familiar with the show your work package, which is uh, facilitates this reproducible publication, but using scripts. So I'm just curious, why should it be Jupyter and why hmm. not just scripts in a good paper? Yeah. Um, this, so for the reproducibility, there is no technical advantage of using Jupyter. Um, if, as long as you script your analysis in some form uh, with show your work or, or some other way or you know bash scripts make file uh, whatever this is all fine and equivalent and i think the benefit for jupiter is more a social aspect and that is that for some people it seems easier to do that kind of work in jupiter than in a purely scripted um, approach and i think the 
the reason for that is that you have this interactive document that you can build up over time and that you can divide your analysis into smaller steps and you can get feedback after every step. And in particular, if something fails, you know where it is and you don't need to identify uh, that is in line 49 out of your 100 line script, but you can see which, which cell fails and you can inspect the variables and so on. So technically there's no advantage uh, in using Jupyter, but from a social aspect, it seems to work for some group of scientists. And once you have it there, um, you know, then you might as well use it for that um, purpose. But you could of course convert it to a Python script as you do. Um, you can also execute the Jupyter notebook as a script. So you don't need to convert that if you don't want to. But it's a, it's a good question um, because we, you know, we didn't discuss it in that differentiated way. Any more questions? Yes, we have a question. And if I may add, I would say that Jupyter notebooks are very good to teach. I mean, it's a little bit like debugging the code, seeing how you progress, how you advance. And I think that to teach people the techniques and what it's doing is, is very good as well. Um, also a Jupyter related question. So you said that uh, the problem with binder is to transfer the data if it's big data. So do you think that Jupyter Hub instance in facilities that have direct access to the facility data can help in promoting fair data and fair reprodu and reproducible science? Yes, um, I think actually technically the difference between a binder hub which provides a binder service and a Jupyter Hub is very small. Um, so this is absolutely the way to go because then you have the kind of portal, um, the binder instance close to the data uh, and then you don't need to transport the data and you can from your script or notebook access just the parts of the data that you're interested in and it's on a local file system. So I think that's um, definitely the right way to go. And I think there are various institutions working on, on solutions like that. And that would also save us from having to um, invent a protocol for the partial data transfer, which I think is the, the difficulty here at the moment. Uh, I, I had another question for Claire this time. Is uh, the um, I've, I've seen that UCL seems to be very where you are hosted seems to be very uh, f advanced in fair data and uh, open science. Could you? Uh, how do you, as a scientist, how, how does it filter down to you? Do you do you get like I mean, do you get training in that, or I mean, are you doing things uh, because UCL has taught you to do that that way, or how does it work? Um, so I think UCL is, a, is a, definitely an advocate for fair um, data. I think a big push from it has come from the funders. A lot of the UKR funders um, are requiring open access journals and open access data. Um, so I think quite a bit of it comes filters actually back down through the funding landscapes. And, and for us at the moment, we're uh, funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which also requires data um, in the public domain. Um, and so I think there's there's a cultural awareness here for sure, um, which helps. Um, I think a lot of it is yeah a requirement by the funders, and also for me personally, it's the, you know the it makes the it makes the the data and the, the work have a far bigger reach, which ultimately is 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 the whole goal. So I think yeah those are the things, and it, it's great you know if you're supported by the institution, then it makes a big difference when you go saying you want to try and implement this type of approach, uh, you find support and you feel find people willing to, to help you make it happen. Um, so it definitely plays a role, but they wouldn't say there's kind of formalized teaching, but there's a kind of a supportive atmosphere towards trying to create something like this. Uh, maybe in a very basic question, how to get more scientists to think like you? Uh, I think I think the biggest things are um, it's also it's it's this understanding like it takes a huge amount of effort to make the data fair like you know your your team and all the rest of the people who helped us through the human organ atlas it's been a huge huge effort um and the it's come up a few times like the amount of time it takes to do the data curation that allows this type of work is not trivial and it takes the time of scientists yes 
you have data data curation managers, but you need people who know the data and understand exactly which bits of data are good, which bits of metadata are needed to do this. And I think there needs to be a lot more recognition for data curation as a scientific activity. So, you know, we're, we're pushing at the moment very hard to try and release about another 100 data sets through the portal. And our biggest challenge is to get the data curation for that done. And whilst we do it, we hold up um, publications on that data. Um, and then it's seen as, you know, there's not enough of a scientific output. And I think the data curation needs to be seen as a scientific output in and of itself. And that will encourage people to do it because they get a reward and a recognition for the time they spend. I would support that. I think that's absolutely right. I think it's about the metrics that reward scientists. And at the moment, um, curating your data so that it is useful for others has very limited benefit for the scientists. If anything, it feeds the competition who will uh, take your lovely data and write one nature paper after the other without having to have done the night shifts and the, the initial data analysis. Um, so one could consider uh, how can we change the metrics? That's hard, that goes into policies and, and politics, but for the facilities, there is maybe some, uh, some hope to influence the process and that is through the allocation of beam time. Now, perhaps in that, one can take into account, um, looking back for previous runs of those users, is there any indication that the data they left behind is actually useful? Has anybody asked for it? Has it been cited? Um, if it has been cited as being used in another publication, perhaps one could count this at the same level as that group producing a publication on the data themselves. So that you could say, okay, uh, these are really experts. Um, they've got 50 publications from this one data set, even though they've only written two. Uh, and therefore we will award them the next beam time uh, more happily because they are likely to make a success of it. I think um, just one thing has to come back on that point this idea, I think a lot of people, they worry about making the data fair for exactly the reason you said that, you know, you spend all this time curating and a group will take it and publish a load of stuff on it. And this is something that, that it's, it's not to say that it can never happen, um, but it's interesting, you know, the, the human organ atlas, the data has been up on the portal, really accessible to many people for well over, um, for a year, over a year now. And there are publications from it, people are using it, but it's not as simple as people think to just download data and churn out publications. And so whilst you can't discount that people might do that, I don't think that should be a worry for people not wanting to put their data out there. Um, because in reality, yeah, understanding data and performing the analysis takes a long time and all that effort you've put into data curation and making it mean you're an awful long way ahead of anyone else starting. Um, so I think that's just something to add. Could I just pose a point to, to my two fellow panelists here? Um, so in the um, reanalysis, reuse uh, sense, I mean, firstly, if I look back over my 48 years in, in research, there's really only two instances where I didn't publish um, and, and it, it, from the raw data, um, you know, I mean, initially it wasn't central facilities, but um, that, that took over. Um, and so it's a, this observation is relevant. And in those two cases, it was because things were particularly challenging and, and maybe the idea and the measurements were ahead of the time, uh, you know, the software wasn't there. And so I come back to them. Um, but I guess what you're posing, Hans, is, is that um, the, the researcher, the primary researcher, um, may not have um, gone high enough um, in the publication, the journal's chain, and there is unfortunately a food chain in impact factors uh, sense. So I don't really see um, reanalysis um, in that sense applying uh, in, in the way you, you posed it. And, and the point to, to and while he cogitates on that um, um, candid remark, um, to Claire, um, if I think about the PDB and my uh, Data Bank Japan project, um, with COVID proteins, we had this situation develop in crystallography where we had um, raw data as well as the PDB deposit. And multiple task forces came along, well-meaning, um, trying to improve on what was at the PDB. Um, and they then set up their own individual mini databases and so the structural biologist or the biomedical person came along and didn't really know what where was the definitive 
version. And so that our work with PDBJ is, is we treat it like peer review of a journal and then a submitted article and data. And we sort of advise the PDBJ director on any in, uh, deficiencies in the deposition. And then he goes off to the depositor and, and says, look, our helpful experts have provided this report. Do you think you need to make a, you know, an improved uh, uh, version? And of course, having the raw data archive XRDA uh, also at PDBJ is very handy. So the equivalent for you, Claire, is that you have these um, biomed or even medical doctors coming to your organ atlas. Ra and so my point is rather than reanalyzers to come up and set up a parallel universe of, uh, you know, human organ uh, atlas improved. So they still regard you um, as the, the definitive provider of the best human organ atlas. That seems to be the impression I'm getting. So maybe I'll start to respond. So are you saying, John, that um, you, you don't see the same value in analyzing data that somebody else has captured than the initial work of capturing the data and then analyzing? In effect, that's right. So, so my benefit of um, raw data archiving possibility is I've got the ultimate uh, reproducibility protection in when I decide as, as PI to publish. And I think that's a great thing. Um, now, would I, um, I'm retired now, so, so I'm not running a lab. So I'm very interested in these data catalogs as a possible source of new work because all the money has been spent by others and, and so on. And, and, I, and if I found something interesting that hadn't been taken forward, I, I would contact the PI and say, look, I'm available. Um, I want to help you. Um, I've got expertise X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and they would have to be convinced uh, to take me on. If they didn't, well, I'd leave it. But the presumption within the Panos vision seems to be, and the facilities in Europe, is, is that the access to the data catalogue, you know, is going to be having all sorts of people come along. And I, I'm not sure that's the case. Yes, okay. Um, so I know from the experiments I've been involved in that um, often only a fraction of that has been converted into publications and that um, I cannot guarantee I understand this fully. So perhaps we knew for sure that all the other runs were meaningless, but I suspect that actually people were sidetracked by more exciting looking projects and that there are you know, perhaps half of the runs that could still be yeah. um, used. And so the idea is that potentially there is information hidden and that potentially this may be better use of the taxpayer's money. It is well, a hypothesis, of course. You may well be right that we don't get to a level. Well, Andy uh, checkmates me at this point by, by citing his paleontologist community. And they measure so much stuff um, on the ESRF <laughs> beamline um, that they need to share it with the world's paleontologists. Um, and, and so that, that is indeed a great thing. And, and that, that is, a, is a, certainly a very valid counter argument to, to my own research situation. Yeah, and if your point is right, that there is no point exploiting that data, then we don't need to worry about making it accessible. And I think, well, I think there are two different things here, if I might chip in. One is a reproducibility argument, and the other one is this paleontology, which I think is similar, similar to the human organ atlas, is that uh, this data has been processed to the level that it can be analyzed, but there's not enough people to analyze it. So it makes sense to get more out of the data by making it freely available. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. This isn't raw raw data in the sense it's not straight off the beamline this has already been heavily processed and reconstructed to make it understandable and interactable with and to the stage where yet yeah, people could use it to investigate uh, biomedical hypotheses um and i think it's just that it's the it's you know the the methodologies to analyze the data the standard pipelines do not exist there's a you know we want to use ai machine learning techniques to do this you need a large training database you can never make a large training database unless people put their data out there in the public domain to create a training database that in the future everyone uses to train the models and then suddenly you're able to analyze these data in like a high throughput manner um but until until you get to that point 
the analyses on these are incredibly slow because it requires manual hand labeling by experts to extract the data from and that can take months and months and months to to hand label a single organ and we've got 150 organs in our back catalog um and two experts or something so um this is yeah the need to the need to to share it is is to get those publications up and to get the data out there okay now i have some some questions for you as well for you three and it's about uh, Andy has presented early on the outcomes from PANOSC and, you know, as a, as users, scientists, and also as, as a person that represents your, your community, your user community, the crystallography community, how closely aligned you see this, the outcomes from PANOSC to your needs and the needs of this user community? And maybe more importantly, what are we missing and what should we address first in the future to help you even more? Well, I prepared a slide with my answers. Shall I show it? <laughs> uh, right. So um, I, I won't show the other few slides, which um, were Andy, Andy's original uh, questions. Um, so these are the ones that he posed to us yesterday. Um, how closely aligned uh, Panosk to crystallography? I think very well matched. Uh, is my answer, and I, I, I document that by my slide about um, the you know, bullet points documenting our respective visions with strong, uh, a strong match. Uh, what is missing uh, to implement open science at the European PAN facilities? Um, well, not all Europe's PAN facilities um, are engaged in what PANOSC has done. Um, I, I won't name names. Um, uh, but anyway, I think Panosk, what it's been doing, uh, you know, is, is really been pioneering and, and you know, really congratulations on, on the achievements of Panosk and, and expands. Um, thirdly, how can facilities encourage scientists to adopt open science practices? Um, and I think the main answer is journal policies are important. And so learner society publishers like IUCR journals, um, you know, are de facto closely connected to their community communities uh, you know they're not for profits um, you know all the efforts in developing you know comsifs and checksif and all that over the years yes they come from uh, subscriptions but they were not for profit um, uh, you know journals all along yes it was a small surplus and it was reinvested in the community um, now I have one caveat on this point which is a personal one it's not an IUCR one which is on this point of when to make raw data open. Um, and so I, I mentioned in my whole, whole career, two uh, experiments were slow to complete, took greater than three years. Um, and I, basically as PI, I want, I want to be the person to decide when those raw data uh, are available, but I am willing to make to compromise with the facility and, and write a, a, an IUCR data, raw data letter explaining um, why my analyses are prolonged and at the same time uh, make those raw data uh, open. So I, I think, you know, to generalize that, um, I think, you know, trust the PI more uh, than seems to be implicit in, in the approaches. Anyway, um, some candid responses to Andy's three questions. Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, Claire, Hans, do you have uh, any comments on, on what are we missing and so far what we have produced, how, how useful it is? I have something short. Um, so I think the tools are a good match and that's perhaps not surprising because they came from this community. Um, what is missing in my view is the motivation for scientists to use the tools. Uh, so this comes back to the incentives I, I outlined before. Uh, you know, why should they engage with all of these things? But together with, um, with the stick, um, we also need to offer some support. So perhaps the data stewards could do that. Or you know, we need people who uh, can join an experiment or the analysis and say, you know, we could use this tool for that, or let me, let's do this together for a few hours or a day um, to actually uh, have some impact. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I would say I think the 
Thanos' uh, vision is, is reasonably well aligned with what we're trying to do. I think one of the big things when we're biomedical imaging data, some of the tools are not uh, particularly usable for us uh, as a community. You know, we, we require an awful lot of data interaction and these types of things, which, um, you know, visualizing these really big data sets um, for which the tools are sometimes there, sometimes not. Um, I think the thing that we need help with the most is this uh, this idea of data data curation, and data um, the data stewardship. So we really need help. You know, we're developing new methodologies. They have new and ever evolving metadata, um, and being able and taught how to create these databases and curate the data in a way that's flexible to how these methods evolve. Otherwise, it, it just becomes so difficult. Um, and slows everything up so much. So I think I think more support on data curation and teaching teaching people how to to do it in the first place uh, would be needed. All right. Well, thank you very much, Claire, John, and Hans. It has been great that you could spare some of your time to to do your presentations and to participate in this roundtable. So thank you very much. And now we'll do a little break and we will come back at quarter to four. But yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.